thank you very much. Appreciate it and uh, appreciate the invitation that Liz gave me to uh, come here tonight. Just by word of quick background, uh, I served in the AmeriCal Army Division in uh, Vietnam. Uh, and the AmeriCal Division was actually started in World War II. It began as a task force, uh, Task Force 6814, that came down the east coast of um, the United States out of the uh, harbors of New York through the Canal Zone. And they were rushed over to end up in the French possession uh, island of New Caledonia. And the reason is that the, uh, the French over there was a colonial possession, were very, very concerned that the Japanese were on their way to take over that island. The island was very important because of all of the rare uh, minerals that it had on the island. And so uh, as a task force, we were sent over there. We didn't look like a division. Uh, it was just nuts and bolts. We, for many, many of you will know that uh, just prior to World War II, the Army National Guard divisions and the, and the active divisions had four regiments. And what we did is we triangularized the divisions from four regiments to three regiments to be in line with the way that the Germans had their divisions. And so all of the National Guard uh, divisions had lost one regiment. And so three of those regiments that were lost, uh, the 182nd Regiment out of the Massachusetts National Guard, uh, the 164th Regiment out of the North Dakota National Guard, and the 132nd Regiment out of the uh, Illinois National Guard, they were the orphan regiments in order to get rid of one regiment. And so they put those regiments to New York to get on this, these boats, eight boats, uh, this task force along with artillery units, uh, all kinds of things. Some things didn't make sense to send, but they had it and they sent it. This is the way it was, as you World War II veterans well know, at the beginning of the war. And so they were sent down there. They ended up in New Caledonia as Task Force 6814, and the division Alex uh, commander, Alexander Patch, a brigadier general, he would eventually be a three-star general and he'd end up in the European theater. Uh, he said, well, Task Force 6814 doesn't sound like much. And they called the Pentagon and they said, well, give us a number. Well, we don't have a number to give you. And so Patch, imagine doing this today, Patch had a contest in the division. Let's name the division. And Sergeant David Fonseca and the division signal company thought, well, we're American forces on New Caledonia, so why don't we just squeeze that together and say AmeriCal. American force in New Caledonia. And that wanted, uh, Patch sent an, uh, uh, a message to the Pentagon. They said, yeah, that's fine. So it became the AmeriCal Division. It was the only Army division in our history to ever have a name and not a number. And it wasn't until it was reintroduced in the Cold War for two years in the Panama Canal Zone to protect the Caribbean Basin and everything else that it got its number as the 23rd Division. And then in w Vietnam, uh, the Marines were getting hammered really hard in the first core area of South Vietnam up near the, the North Vietnamese border. Uh, they were just coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and, and, uh, and it was getting pretty bad. So Westmoreland with a sense of history decided, well, they're going to need some help. So we'll have the two Marine divisions go further north on the northern part of First Corps and we'll reactivate it to Maricao because the Maricao worked with the Marines in World War II. So we reactivated. It's the only Army division that was activated. All three times it was activated, it was activated overseas, never in the United States. And all three times it served in a jungle climate. Panama, Vietnam, and then of course World War II. And so it was uh, earned the nickname or the moniker, the Jungle Warriors. Uh, the AmeriCal uh, first went once it got its organization straight in New Caledonia, its first point of, uh, mission was to go to Guadalcanal and it helped the Marines in Guadalcanal and I could go I could give you a whole nightly session on that uh, but suffice it to say that we helped the Marines when they were just about to lose Henderson Field we actually moved one of our uh, regiments in the dead of night up to help the Marines particularly in Chesty Pooler's area there was a three battalion front and they only had two battalions and they were undermanned from malaria and everything so uh, we say, and as a result of that and a number of other things, we received the uh, United States Navy Presidential Citation for our work on Guadalcanal. 
Uh, and once the Marines, we relieved the Marines, the AmeriCal Division commander became the head of that. And then, uh, because just like the 1st Marine Division, we got suffered so much from malaria and everything else. After Guadalcanal, we were there eight or nine months. We went on to Fiji for a rest, a recuperation, bringing reinforcements. And then we went to the island of Bougainville. And just like uh, Guadalcanal, we relieved the Marines on Bougainville. They had established a perimeter. We came in there and we kicked some tail there, uh, some heavy fighting for uh, many months on Bougainville. And one of our things is we uh, knocked out the uh, Japanese 6th Division, which was infamous for the rape of Nanking in China uh, before the Americans got into a war. And uh, we took care of them, and I, I could go on and on. After that, there was no stopping. We were sent to the Philippines. And that's where I want to get into um, what we did here uh, uh, in March. Uh, the AmeriCal first went to Leyte and helped mop up operations there. Uh, the Japanese militarily were defeated, but there were still over 10,000 Japanese on Leyte, and the American military did not want them to be able to sneak out of Leyte and go to some of the other Philippine islands, and so they brought the AmeriCal there to help mop them up. And it was, a, it was a, just a, a kill-all policy. We were not going to allow them to survive, and uh, that's just what we did. And then, then we went into uh, the Visayas and the Philippines. And our big thing was we invaded the island of Cebu. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, because uh, it holds a special place in my heart uh, based on the trip that we made. And so that's what I want to talk to you about, our experience, the AmeriCal Division on Cebu. And it says a lot about the enemy we face in the whole Pacific War and a number of other things. So. Uh, from March the 23rd to the 27th of this year, uh, a group of us AmeriCal Army Division veterans from uh, Vietnam uh, retraced the steps of our World War II force fathers who fought for freedom for the Philippine people in 1945 on the island and province of Cebu. 2015, this year, marked the 70th anniversary of Cebu's liberation. So I'm going to ask you to join me for the next 30 minutes in taking a trip back in time to remember this island's struggle for freedom. The Philippine Islands are located only 1,900 miles from Japan, and strategically, Japan needed the Philippines to prevent Allied forces from using them as a forward base of operations against the Japanese homeland. Located in Southeast Asia in the Western Pacific Ocean, the Philippines were also strategically located to support Japanese forces in their conquests of Burma, Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam, and all of Indonesia. And during the war, the Philippine Islands were occupied by about 135,000 Japanese military troops and about 225 aircraft. Although the Philippines contained 7,107 islands, the three major geographic groups of islands are Luzon, the Visayas, and Mindanao. And it is in the Visayas, particularly the islands of Cebu, Samar, Negros, Oriental, Leyte, and Bohol, where control of the key waterways through the islands made Cebu a key target for the Japanese invaders. If you control the Visayas, you control the Philippines, and the Japanese understood this. This long cigar-shaped island right here is Cebu. Leyte, Cebu, Negros, Bohol, this whole central area right in here is the Visayas, okay? And there's a lot of waterways that come through here, and that was the key to controlling uh, the Philippines. Cebu is the smallest island, but it was the most populated. Compared to the main island of Luzon, an island of 40,420 square miles, which held the nation's capital of Manila. The island of Cebu is much smaller, containing only 1,905 square miles. But at the beginning of World War II, Cebu City was the second largest city in the Philippines, containing 150,000 residents. And it was a manufacturing and shipping hub for the Philippine economy. And as you can see, Cebu is a cigar-shaped island not very long and rather narrow in most areas. And this was a reality that impressed us when we were in Cebu in March. 
uh, as we relate it to the island's guerrilla movement against their Japanese oppressors. While the main island of Luzon had many more Japanese soldiers occupying the island, the large expanse of land, particularly in northern Luzon, gave the American stay-behind forces and Philippine guerrillas a very large area to escape and evade. The guerrillas on Cebu, however, were much more vulnerable since Japanese forces in Cebu City and various bases on the island along both coasts could surge their forces to attack Philippine guerrillas rapidly with deadly effect. The Japanese also had some attack aircraft based in Cebu City to hit the guerrillas from the air wherever they could be found. The number of Japanese on the island varied in strength, but generally was estimated at 15,000 soldiers, naval forces, and support personnel. The guerrillas, on the other hand, had to be on constant alert lest they be annihilated from a surprise attack. But the guerrillas always attacked the Japanese forces when the conditions were right to be a serious threat to the enemy and to help lift the morale of the Filipino people on Cebu. It was this dynamic of having little space to run and hide that resulted in guerrillas on Cebu killing more of the Japanese enemy than the guerrillas on Luzon or anywhere else in the Philippines. It's tough to estimate, but the, the most accurate estimates we have is the Cebu guerrillas killed anywhere between 6,000 and 8,000 uh, Japanese forces in the four years that they were uh, uh, oppressed by the Japanese. Immediately after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941, Japanese forces landed on Cebu just south of Cebu City on the eastern side of the island and simultaneously landed across the island on the western side at the town of Toledo. I want to show you, this is about 320 miles north and south, but at the widest point it's only about 25 miles. Not only were the Japanese stationed in Cebu City, but on some of the major towns, these are mostly all small towns, but all up and down the coast. It doesn't take much for trained soldiers like the Japanese to quickly grab their forces and surge inland to go after the Cebu guerrillas uh, from various points. Usually they would attack the Cebu guerrillas uh, with about three attack points. And the interior here up the bone of Cebu uh, is mountainous, but uh, for the rest of it, it's not too bad. There's some hills and as you get closer to the, to the coast, uh, it widens out. So the Cebu guerrillas really had some unique situations there that they really had to pay attention to. Okay. The only organized resistance when the Japanese landed on Cebu was in the coastal town of Toledo, as I showed you. It was on the, uh, the western uh, northwest coast. Prior to World War II, the United States military had nominal control of military forces in the Philippines. The day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, military forces ordered the full mobilization of the 82nd and 83rd Philippine Infantry Regiments on Cebu. Citizens who were called to active duty to fight had never fired any kind of weapon and were issued old Enfield rifles that were prone to malfunction. There was simply no training time or adequate arms to prepare any formidable force to face the Japanese. Now what you see on the screen are some of the defensive measures taken in the coastal town of Toledo that we, were, we visited and spent a lot of time there. Uh, pictured below is the main road from the coast moving inland as seen from a hilltop in the town. So I'm standing on top of the hill in Toledo. Right now the city hall is up there and some other things, but also some of these uh, fighting positions that the uh, Cebu uh, Army, uh, uh, the Philippine Army uh, tried to man. But the reason that hill was so important is when the Japanese landed on the coast, there was only one road going inland, and you see that road right here. So that hilltop was a strategic defensive portion uh, for the, the Filipinos. Uh, top left is an example of the defensive positions on the hill from where the J uh, Philippine forces fought valiantly to keep the Japanese from moving inland. But after one day of fighting, the Japanese were just too much to handle 
and they outflanked the defenders, uh, forcing them to retreat into the hills of Cebu to begin a campaign of guerrilla warfare for over three years until we, the Americal Division, would land on March the 26th, 1945. And that's one of the reasons I was there. The, the Filipino people never forgot that. And every year since the end of World War II, every year on March 26th, at Talise Beach, just south of Cebu, about eight miles south of Cebu City, that town has a ceremony to honor the Americans. And we were guests of honor there, and one of the big thrills that I got is I actually got to talk to uh, a couple of Filipino guerrillas that were still living. And it was just a great, great time. And the Philippine Marines actually reenact the Americal landing. So they have landing craft that come on. It's, it's really quite the thing. But on these slides of note here also I want to point out are the tank barriers that are seen on the top right. These barriers were in place from the coast of Toledo for 10 miles inland to form a barrier against Japanese tanks and other armored vehicles. Of course the Japanese overcame them in a matter of hours. Also of the note is the fact that these fighting positions and tank barriers were used uh, by, uh, with cement from an American-owned cement factory in Toledo. The same cement factory that helped provide the cement with the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. That's how big that operation was and they actually shipped the cement from the Philippines. After the Americans surrendered at Corregidor off the main island of Luzon and the infamous Bataan death march was begun, American and Philippine military forces throughout the islands were ordered to formally surrender. But many Filipino military personnel throughout the islands then took to the interior to wage guerrilla warfare uh, rather than submit to their occupiers. Unfortunately, most of the American military officers, when General Wainwright surrendered Corregidor, the Japanese said, we're not going to allow you to surrender Corregidor we're going to massacre all of you until you, General, put out the order that all American forces in the Philippine Islands, not only on Corregidor or Luzon, but all over, all of you must surrender. And so that's the word that went out. And so a lot of these uh, officers in the case of Cebu, they had already started going into the interior to start fighting uh, the guerrillas and planning. Uh, they were told you must surrender or there's going to be a massacre. So the vast majority of the American officers came out and they surrendered. And as I was talking to these two gentlemen here, so many of them ended up in uh, prisoner camps on Luzon or in many cases they were put on these death ships that were uh, uh, Japanese freighters, uh, thousands put on these things and they were sent to all parts, uh, Manchuria, Korea, Japan proper to work as slave laborers and unfortunately uh, at, when that occurred, the, uh, the, um, the American uh, forces had complete control of the seas and the air, and they saw these uh, Japanese uh, ships going there, and, well, that's the enemy, and they bombed them and, and uh, destroyed them. Tens of thousands of Americans and, and other prisoners just died. The Americans didn't know that they were prisoners on there being taken. Just, they were called hell ships. At their peak strength, by the time the Americal Army Division landed on Cebu in March 1945, there were approximately 8,500 guerrillas on Cebu. But only 2,700 had any weapons of any kind, including 33 automatic rifles, 14 machine guns, and a half dozen mortars against 15,000 well-trained Japanese. But the guerrillas used what they had to deadly effect. But as the guerrillas killed the Japanese, the enemy replaced its, office, its losses with more Japanese forces that were sent to Cebu from other parts of the Pacific that were being lost to the Americans. And so as other parts of the Philippines lost in Luzon and Mindanao and other places, they would, and any means possible, any small ships, whatever, they were moving the Japanese to Cebu. So even though the guerrillas killed six to seven, eight thousand of them, they were pushing more uh, Japanese to that island. That was going to be the last stand island for the Philippines. Now most of the unarmed guerrillas were used as spies and trail watchers, which gave the guerrillas ample warning when Japanese forces were approaching uh, 
to either engage them in an ambush or to fade away if the enemy was too large. And that's, that's being in special forces for many years. Uh, I understand uh, insurgencies and guerrilla warfare, and that's a must. The people have to be the eyes and ears of the guerrillas. And they did that very well in the, the in this Philippines, particularly in Cebu. Uh, they were called VGs, volunteer guards. They didn't have weapons for them. So they sat on trails. They were in their little villages or what they call barrios. And as soon as the Japanese forces were coming, they'd send some young kid right up to the, uh, to the guerrilla camps and let them know how many trucks were coming, how many estimated enemy, and so forth. And on a, a narrow island like Cebu, it's the only way you could survive as a guerrilla force. But they did that very well. Uh, many of the unarmed guerrillas were also used to carry supplies and food to support the guerrillas in the interior of the country. It was those, those efforts of those guerrillas without weapons that kept the guerrilla movement alive. By war's end, the occupying Japanese forces on the Philippine Islands would kill over one million Filipinos. Now here you see two posters that were prevalent in Cebu during the occupation. The one on the left is written in the local dialect of Cebu citizens, or Cebuanos as we call them, and it directs all citizens to seek written permission to obtain the basic staples of life, such as rice, sugar, salt, cocoa, cooking oil, etc. I could go through the list in detail, but anything that would sustain a Philippine citizen with a staff of life, including alcohol, gasoline, everything else, was all prohibited unless you had written permission from the Japanese uh, to have it. And they would tell you how much you had to have and when you could have it and everything else. Any Filipino caught with these goods without written permission from the Japanese high command would be severely punished. The only foodstuffs not listed in this list were tubular plants or root crops because, which grew wild and were difficult for the Japanese to control. Now the poster on the right, written in English, and by the way, uh, the Filipinos speak two languages over there, English and Filipino, Tagalog, uh, and I was very impressed when we were all over that island, we were in some very small towns uh, in, the, in the middle of the island, and the kids would come out in their shorts and taught us, spoke excellent English. Better than mine, I'm from New Jersey, so I didn't have a Jersey accent, okay? And um, the literacy rate in Cebu is 85%. So it is really something to see. But in this poster to the right, <coughs> uh, it issues a warning uh, to, uh, to the Filipinos. Anyone who inflicts or attempts to inflict an injury upon a Filipino soldier or an individual uh, will be severely punished with death. And uh, if, if uh, any soldier, Japanese soldier, was killed, uh, they would go to the 10 Filipino citizens in that immediate area where they had anything to do with it or not, and they'd line them up and they'd kill them. Uh, when the Japanese took over Cebu City, they ringed the whole city with the bamboo uh, wall. And they only had two openings, in the north side and the south side and the Filipinos would come and go in the island. A lot of the Filipinos got out of the city, went into the interior to their relatives to hide and everything else, but the Japanese retained anyone who had any knowledge of how to run the water plants, the electricity, and all this other stuff, and trying to set up some normal, uh, semblance of normal, normalcy in the, uh, in the city. Uh, but the Filipinos that would come and go to try to trade market goods and that kind of thing, you would have some Japanese private there uh, standing at a gate, and that Filipino came in. If that Filipino did not bow deeply, uh, they were beaten. And depending on the mood of the Japanese uh, soldier, he could shoot him too. That's how brutal it was. Okay. The city of Cebu, which held a population of 150,000 before the war, quickly shrunk in size as citizens fled to the interior to hide or join the guerrilla movement. A bamboo fence, as I mentioned, was erected on the north side and the south side, and as I said, uh, those that did not properly bow to the Japanese guard, it could just be a private in the Japanese army, they were severely executed or, uh, or beaten, uh, depending on the, the, the mood of the guard. It is difficult for a 21st century audience, such as what we have here tonight, to understand and comprehend the brutality of the Japanese Empire in World War II. 
In its rampage over the Pacific area, Japan brought atrocity and death on a scale that staggers the imagination. Japan held some 132,000 POWs from America, Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Holland, and Australia. And of those 132,000, 36,000 died, one in four. And Americans fared particularly badly. Of the 34,648 Americans held by Japan, 12,935, more than 37 percent, died. In World War II, only one percent of Americans held by the Nazis and Italians died. Only one percent, compared to 37 percent by the Japanese. After three hard years of fighting the Japanese in the Southwest Pacific on Guadalcanal and Bougainville, the American Army Division finally reached the Philippines to help keep General MacArthur's famous promise, I will return. The American Division was given the primary mission to liberate the Visayan Islands and the strategic sea lanes through them, which would control the Japanese military's efforts to reinforce itself in the Philippines. Chief among their objectives was the strategic island of Cebu. On March 26, 1945, the Americal landed on Talise Point Beach, about eight miles south of Cebu City. This was coincidentally the same location that the Japanese had landed in 1941 to conquer Cebu. Now the Americans set out to liberate it. The Japanese laced the beach area with many mines, did, but did not defend the beach area with ground troops, preferring instead to set fires in Cebu City and move to the mountains overlooking the city for a defense in depth. The mines on the beach caught 14 fatalities in the first 15 minutes, and 10 of the first 15 landing craft bringing soldiers ashore were disabled by mines. The heavy concentration of mines stalled the attack for two hours before enough mines could be cleared to move inland. From that point on, the Americal never looked back until the Japanese surrendered on August the 28th, 1945. Japanese defensive doctrine at that time called for moving out of urban areas and concentrating their forces in the interior of the island they were defending where better defensive positions could be created. The idea was to kill as many Americans as possible to forestall an invasion of the Japanese homeland. Even before the American forces began to liberate the Philippines, the Japanese High Command knew they were losing the war. Holding the Philippines was crucial to keep the Americans from setting up the Philippines as advanced bases to attack their homelands. And in fact, American military planners had nominated Cebu with its excellent port system to be the jump off point for three army divisions that would be shifted from Europe for the invasion of Japan. Now here on the map you can see where the Americal landed and the three rings of defense the Japanese prepared for in heavily fortified bunkers and tunnels above Cebu City. And I want to point out something here. So we landed in Talise Beach right in this area here about eight miles from Cebu City. Uh, this was the first ring of defense. It was called the outpost line. Up here in the mountains was in Babag Ridge. It was a heavy, heavily high uh, area ridge. You'll see pictures of it in a minute. This was the main resistance line for the Japanese. And then up here uh, was the final defensive line, the, what they called the, the hold all line and the, where they were going to die, uh, you know, resisting. Unfortunately, when the Japanese started preparing for this, uh, and they did the same thing in Luzon, uh, Bougainville, all over. That was their, their thing, is not to defend the beaches, but get inland. They did, did it on Iwo, too. Uh, but what they did is the Japanese took uh, all of these Philippine guerrilla, or the Philippine citizens in Cebu City that knew how to run uh, the city with the electricity, the water power plants and all this other. They took them back up into the hills with them into the caves and they looted the entire city. They took all kinds of stuff up there just hoping upon hope that uh, they would defeat the Americans and then they would have that stuff. 
And unfortunately, the, the fighting was so massive to take those ridge lines uh, that we were using um, uh, destroyers, uh, aircraft. We had, we had developed napalm at that point in the war, just all kinds of things just to get up there. The caves, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, just were terrible. And so what ended up happening is by the time we overtook the, the enemy uh, at the top of the ridges and they decided to retreat to go north, um, the Cebu citizens that were up there, either we killed them with American firepower or the Japanese just slaughtered them uh, prior to them moving out. Uh, but here you can see on the lower right is a, a picture of us landing. Again, this was not uh, Guadalcanal or Iwo in the sense that we had heavy fire uh, on the, the beaches uh, the Japanese had pulled ahead. As it turned out, because of the heavy mines, had they decided to defend the beaches, uh, they could have caused a lot of American casualties. Uh, but once we got through the mines, we were able to uh, get away from that. For several weeks in uh, April 1945, the fighting was intense as the American Division fought over numerous ridgelines, yard by yard, to defeat the Japanese. Navy destroyers, Army Air Force bombers, and the division's artillery were used to pummel the heavily fortified enemy positions. Even the anti-aircraft battalion that we had on the island turned its guns on the ridges and enemy emplacements to support the ground troops as it was no longer a threat of Japanese aircraft. So even the aircraft, anti-aircraft guns just went ground level and just went into the ridges. Now when we were there in March, we entered into some of those caves and fighting positions that are pictured here, which were very deep and well prepared. Some of the positions higher up on the ridges still have not been adequately explored to this day as they were just too numerous. On the lower levels of the Japanese line of resistance closer to the city, the tunnel system was so immense that even today there are incidents of a Filipino building a house only to have it collapse because it was built over a Japanese tunnel. So that, that still happens today. When the Japanese torched Cebu City to retreat into the high ridgelands above the city, as I mentioned earlier, they forced the civilians who were running the basic function of the city under their watchful eyes to move up with them. And along with that, they took art, silver, gold, all kinds of things. And as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, the fighting was so heavy, and we're trying to preserve American lives in, in the assault forces, that uh, many of those uh, Filipinos died either from American firepower or when the Japanese decided not to fight to the death at the top of the ridge, but to move north to join other Japanese forces, they just slaughtered the rest of the uh, Filipinos and, and moved on. Now this is where it gets personal, okay? When we visited various sites in Cebu City, we obtained a glimpse of what life was like under Japanese occupation. Pictured here is the Cebu Normal University. The word normal refers to its liberal arts focus as it, was mainly taught, as it mainly taught students earning teaching degrees but also now includes a college of arts and sciences and provides nursing training as well. This building that now supports the humanities of teaching and healing was the Kemp T. Tai headquarters of the Japanese secret police during its occupation. We walked through the building and were told that the classrooms were former holding cells for prisoners. We entered the basement where the rooms served as torture chambers where pregnant women were raped. Outside in the courtyard is where the executions occurred at the dead of night, and bodies were secretly buried. Pictured to the right is a side entrance to the basement. Those interior rooms where so much torture took place, the scene of so much horror during the war. It is now used for the university's campus ministry. We also visited the UP College of Cebu, shown here in the upper left. This was another facility of the Japanese military police. The building initially was used by the Japanese as an internment camp for American and British civilians before they were shipped to Manila, and then it was used as a stockade for condemned prisoners. Walking inside, we noticed many classrooms that were used for interrogations. We walked outside on a second floor balcony by the side of the building, and you can see the upper right picture up top, you can see the balcony. Uh, we stood out there. 
It was here that the Japanese police would stand on the balcony and tell the prisoners assembled below who would die that day and who would be executed the following day. We walked around on the courtyard below and saw a hotly contested intramural basketball game being played by the students with other students cheering their team on. The scene was surreal. There, pictured below on the screen, are the students enjoying freedom and peace with the infamous balcony in the background, you can see, where once edicts of death were given. And this was a horror that the students at the university would not have to bear because Filipino guerrillas and American soldiers made the sacrifice 70 years before for their freedom to get an education. During May through early July 1945, the American Army slowly pressured the Japanese as the enemy made its retreat to the northern part of the island. Along the way were numerous incidents of Japanese rape and murder against Filipinos. It became so prevalent that our division dropped pamphlets in the enemy areas warning that all Japanese officers would be held to account for these atrocities. And I'll go back briefly, when we were on one of the sub-islands in the Visayas, I believe it was Bohu, uh, we landed and uh, three of our soldiers were captured by the Japanese and they were summarily executed. And so from that point on, there was no holds barred. The Americans saw that the, the, the war was coming to an end. They weren't going to give up their lives needlessly. So um, the Japanese were taken care of, unless it was absolutely certain that Japanese had no weapons, no nothing, they had their hands up, then we took prisoners. Otherwise, there was no prisoners. It is estimated, as I said before, that the Filipino guerrillas on Cebu killed between 6,000 and 8,000 enemy during their more than three years of occupation under Japanese rule. When the American Division landed on Cebu in March of 1945, Intelligence estimate placed the enemy strength at that time at about six to 8,000 Japanese. But in fact, the enemy strength would double that amount because Japanese troops had been brought to Cebu when other parts of the Philippines had been lost to American army landings. Uh, we thought that the guerrillas had done a great job and our latest estimate was this is, this is the range, six to 8,000. But the Japanese had managed to get so many off the other islands to Cebu that we were faced with that greater number. As the Japanese were pursued in their retreat to the north, the Filipino guerrillas, now fully armed by us, harassed them at every turn and kept close eye on their movements. This allowed the American Division to know where the enemy was and inflict heavy casualties on the enemy with little casualties to themselves. By mid-July 1945, the enemy was boxed in at the northern part of Cebu. The enemy was soundly defeated throughout the Pacific and the American Division, rather than make frontal assaults on the, what we thought were the few remaining Japanese, we were told to begin training and preparing for the invasion of Japan. So the Japanese in the remaining islands, we thought there was, in the northern part of Cebu, at that time, we thought maybe another uh, 1,500 Japanese were left uh, we'll hold them in place. The Philippine guerrillas could keep char uh, charge of them and, and watch them. And then uh, 82 kilometers north of Cebu City at a town, Liloan, uh, we actually started training for the invasion of Japan. For the most part, the Filipinos took over much of the fighting to keep the Japanese military ensconced in their lairs. When the atomic bombs were dropped, there was pure joy in the American Army Division. They were part of three divisions who were destined to make the first attack on Japan in the southern island of Kyushu. The first invasion, those three divisions, America was going to be one of them. I'm a trained oral historian. I've done oral histories with uh, some of our World War II veterans in the America division. They have told me to, to a man separately. They weren't gathered. They all told me the same thing. They were told on Cebu, all right, we're going to go up. You're going to be one of the first divisions to invade Kyushu, that would be our base. Uh, and if you make it through the first three days on shore, we'll have ships pick you up and bring you out. That's what they were expecting. It would have been a bloodbath of American soldiers, without a doubt. And, and I get into this discussion with a lot of people as a World War II historian. Um, they, um, uh, the, the Japanese uh, 
actually save more people by us dropping the bomb than the Americans would have ever saved. The Japanese, they would have been wiped out as a people had we gone in there. Word of Japan's surrender was sent through the Japanese remaining on Cebu through leaflets posted at trail junctions in their area of retreat. The Japanese did not believe the war was lost. And through a series of messages through leaflets nailed on a post at a key trail junction, the Japanese general sent two junior officers who spoke English to the Americals headquarters to listen to broadcasts from the Japanese Emperor Hirohito in Tokyo, which was the first time the Japanese people ever heard his voice. Additional information convinced the Japanese officers uh, that the war was over and arrangements were made for a formal surrender. And when they started to come in to surrender, that's when we realized there were like 8,000 that came in to surrender instead of the 1,500 we thought that were there. Um, and I'll also tell you that uh, the Americans went up at the surrender site and uh, when we brought the Japanese, we had army trucks to bring them in uh, and we, we checked them out, make sure they didn't have any weapons or grenades for Harry Carry or any of that stuff. And we, were put, and we had American soldiers on those trucks to guard them against the Filipino citizens when we brought them back to Cebu. And as fast as we could, we got them on ships and sent them back to Japan. We finished our week in Cebu with the dedication of a monument on the exact spot where the surrender papers were signed. We paid for that, our association. There's a VFW post over there in Cebu City. Uh, and so they did all the legwork for us and got the contractors and we paid for it. The lady who owned the property, who deeded that space for us, had been a five-year-old child who witnessed the surrender. Her father owned the property at that time, at the time of the surrender. The father had another teenage daughter who was quite looking, so good looking. So the lady that deeded the property to us during the war, she was only five and she saw the actual surrender. Her sister, who was a teenager, she told us, she was a very nice looking young lady. Well, our, our, her father uh, had her sister, the good looking one, hide in a barrel because having witnessed the brutality of the Japanese on young women, she was not sure how the Americans would be. And so to take no chances, she hid in a barrel <laughs> and missed the whole surrender ceremony, okay? Uh, but that's the way it was. We walked the grounds where goats now graze and she pointed the direction the Japanese march from the hills. And I think this just went out on me. All right, I'll speak louder. My wife says I have a big mouth anyway. We walked the grounds where goats now graze and she pointed the direction that the Japanese marched in from the hills and the location, which is now a dry well, where the enemy dropped their rifles or what she called they dropped their sticks, as she called them. In another pile, all the officer's swords were dropped. And one of the beautiful things being a historian is, as you know, you go back so often many years later and nothing looks the same. It's all different. Buildings are there. This place still looked the same because the family kept the property the way it was. And it just gave me goosebumps to be standing there. And she says, right through that opening there on that ridge, that's the Japanese came. And I had World War II pictures that were taken at that time. Sure enough, there it is. So it was just a great, great feeling. Um, and so uh, approximately five, at that first surrender on August the 28th, 5,500 and around 50 Japanese, uh, well, no, let me go back. During our fighting with, on this island of Cebu, we killed 5,550 Japanese, more or less. And most of that was by body count, so we're pretty sure of the numbers. The Americal lost 410 men killed and 1,700 wounded. Not high losses compared to some of the other island fighting. Okay, we lost a lot on Guadalcanal and Bougainville. But when we got to the Cebu, it was firepower, and we used it to the maximum extent. Throughout the fight against the Japanese during the occupation of Cebu, the Filipino guerrillas lost about 3,600 killed and 6,200 wounded. Many more civilian Filipinos were killed from Japanese barbarity. The Americal Division, thinking that the Japanese had no more than two to 3,000 left on the island, were surprised to see that in the end, as I mentioned before, uh, about 8,500 Japanese surrendered. 
And this was a combination of soldiers, sailors, and even Japanese nurses. As I said, they were all brought from other parts of the islands to get on Cebu uh, because they couldn't get further away than that. And they surrendered over a period of 10 days after the initial surrender at that surrender monument on August the 28th. After searching them for any hidden weapons, as I said, the Japanese were all trucked to Cebu City, where they were immediately placed on transport ships and sent to Japan. Much more humane treatment than was given to our soldiers and the Filipinos in the war. And I wasn't there, but I've read enough about it for the last 19 years as a World War II historian, and I've talked to uh, many, many World War II veterans in our division, and I feel like I was there. And I've spoken to some of them to this day they, they will not speak to a Japanese. And, and you have to understand that, you, and, and, uh, and, I, and I certainly do. Okay, the photo on the right was taken in Cebu City, the site of the Cebu Veterans Memorial dedicated to the guerrillas of World War II. There are many ways to s sum up my experiences there. I could be here all night, which I'm not going to be. I'm ending now. But there are many ways I could summarize the feelings and what we saw and, and what hit my gut for the week we spent in Cebu. But I think that that monument and the writing on that monument says it all. This was dedicated by the Filipino government to the Filipino guerrillas on Cebu, and this is what it says. This monument is an eloquent oblation, like hands reaching for heaven soulful in supplication, which stands for the noble living and the noble dead, whose dreams and hopes shall, in the end, hopefully find reward in an enduring freedom from all kinds of tyrannies, suppressions, fears, and wants. My friends, this experience of Cebu and its people in World War II is a stark reminder that there is evil in the world. And those who wish to ignore it out of convenience will be destined to experience it again. Thank you. I don't know how much time we have. If you have any questions or Q&A or anything, be happy to uh, entertain any questions. The things, uh, those of you that read the book Unbroken, uh, it was pointed out in there, the Japanese uh, we're losing the islands, and they, so they established a kill-all policy. Kuala Jane, Kuala Zain, I won't, the Marines know the name of the thing, uh, and Palawan, Palawan was another one. They had 5,000 Korean laborers on um, Palo, Palawan, I think is the way you pronounce it, island working, 5,000. And when the, the American forces got close to that island, they lined them all up and killed them all. Uh, in Japan, and it's in the book Unbroken, in Japan, because of the kill-all policy, as the Americans started getting closer to the, the, uh, the islands of Japan, uh, they had about 36,000 American prisoners on the island of Japan in various camps all over the place. And the guards began rehearsing. They would move their, their prisoners out of their particular camp and move them to an isolated area, whether it was in a forest or somewhere else on, on a secluded shoreline or whatever else, away from any population. And they actually rehearsed it, how much time would it take for us to move them out and go in there, and they were going to kill them all. And that's what was waiting. And for those hypocrites who say we never should have dropped the bomb, it was racist and everything else, one of the reasons that Hirohito immediately gave up the kill-all policy is he, he knew that if they did that, after experiencing the bombs, of course he didn't know how many bombs we had, he knew that the whole island would be turned to ashes. You know, assuming we had the bombs, which we didn't. So that was one of his first things that he did is he, he immediately canceled the kill-all policy on, on the island of Japan. Uh, the question is, what about my experience in Vietnam? I was with the AmeriCal Division. Uh, I never heard of it. Prior to that, I went through officer candidate school, Army Airborne School, how to jump out of perfectly good airplanes like Leland does, and, and then the Army Ranger School. So I volunteered for the 101st Airborne, the 82nd Airborne, the 173rd Airborne, all the glory units, and I got over there and I said, well, you're going to the Americal. I said, the Ameri-what? 
and it's like, even in Vietnam, it was the 23rd Division, but they called it the AmeriCal because of its history. And I said, no, 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 I thought it was like an advisory thing. I said, no, 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 I said, you don't understand, I'm infantry. I go, he said, oh, you're going to the infantry. <laughs> and we were, we were up there in the southern part of uh, First Corps, where about, um, forget the numbers, but uh, of all the casualties in Vietnam, uh, probably of all the, the areas in there, uh, I think it was about 17% came just from the area where we were. So it was a very tough area. So I was only, being an infantry officer, I was only there four and a half months. I was shot twice. I was hit head, neck, and ear with shrapnel from a mine. One of my men stepped on that I stepped over, and I had a bout of malaria. So welcome to the infantry, particularly junior officers. We don't last too long. And so uh, I came home, and I was telling Liz, uh, I'm from New Jersey, and so I was sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and uh, met a, a young lady who was an Army nurse taking the operating room course there who was from Cleveland, Ohio. And we met at a social, and he got engaged and married. And uh, uh, this July 11th, coming up, will be 45 years. And so what I tell people is the Army issued me a wife. And so that's the way. So that's my background on that. Yeah, the, the battle on Leyte uh, was pretty tough, pretty tough. We didn't do the initial. There were other Army divisions. But because uh, MacArthur said, I don't want any of those Jap SOBs getting off Leyte, try to prevent them from doing that, uh, they brought our division on there to help out with the mop-up operations. And we ended up killing, I think it was around 3,500 Japanese just on Leyte as a mop-up operation. Uh, one other thing I want to, before I forget, the Filipino guerrillas were very well known for this. Uh, when they were fighting there, uh, Admiral Ko Koga, K-O-G-A, was the head of all the Pacific fleet uh, in that part of the uh, Japanese islands, okay, or the, the Pacific. Very, very powerful guy. And he was moving his headquarters, and he was flying in a seaplane, uh, and then his assistant was in another seaplane. And on his person was this briefcase that was encased in waterproof stuff, and it was called the Z-Plan. And it was the entire operational plan for defense of, of the Southwest Pacific from the Americans. And his plane, they were off the coast of Cebu, off the eastern coast, uh, Talise, where we landed, south of Cebu City, it was off of that direction, and they got into a storm. And his plane went down and crashed, and he, and, he, and he died. The other plane, his deputy, went, also went down, but he survived. And so he and some of his men managed to get to shore, to the Philippine shoreline. And here are these coast watchers, the Filipino guerrillas, saw that. And they see these guys bobbing, they're drowning and everything else. So they went out on these small little craft to grab them and, and to bring them in and everything else. And uh, there were a couple Japanese that actually got further north towards the city, but they run. So here they go, they, they get, they get uh, this rear admiral, as well as some of his key staff. And then the next day, here comes this big attache case, water washes up the shore, the whole bloody defensive plan. And the, the, one, the one guerrilla had bursitis, he couldn't get out. He told his brother, go over and get that stuff. And, and they went in there and some of the papers were wet so they took it in and they, they looked at it and said, this looks pretty important. So they actually dried it out. And then they said, well, we can't get caught here because the Japanese were coming down the coastal road. So they put it all back together and they moved it inland a little further. And then they, they buried it. And you got to understand that the, the Japanese were looking for that. And they were also looking for the prisoners. The prisoners went inland too uh, with the guerrillas. The guerrillas were controlled by two Americans, uh, James Cushing, who was a lieutenant in the, in the army, but he was a mining engineer from New Mexico, okay? And then there was another guy who was a DJ in Philippine radio, and, and he was in there, and so he took over the administrative stuff, and Cushing actually led the guerrillas. He is legendary. He, he's almost to the point of sainthood in Cebu, this Cushing, really neat guy. Anyway, they're, they're moving all this stuff inland, the prisoners and everything else, and the Japanese went nuts. They went ballistic, and they're coming down, and they're just wiping out whole villages and everything else. If they think that they were hiding something, they were just brutal. And finally, it got to a point where Cushing uh, had some radio contact 
back in Australia through some relay stations. Uh, so we finally got back there and says, I got these prisoners. What do you want me to do with them? And he waited and waited and waited. In the meantime, the Japanese are just being absolutely brutal. And Cushing loved the Filipino people. And he says, you know what? He says, I can't let all these people die because... So he, he sent some guys up to the Japs and made a bargain with them. He says, you stop killing the, the Filipino people and, and I'll release the prisoners. Now, he didn't know he had these papers yet. So he released the prisoners. And then finally, MacArthur's headquarters came back and says, under no circumstances, release the prisoners. Well, it's too damn late. Pardon my French. And, but then these papers came in. And they started looking at us. Man, this looks important. And so they finally got them wrapped up. And they went over to uh, Negros Oriental, the island not too far away. And, and then Cebu only received supplies once during the war to the guerrillas from a submarine. Uh, the shorelines of Cebu was just too dangerous. And so they only did it once. Usually, uh, Negros, which is on the west side, which isn't far away, they would land there. And then the, the Filipinos would grab the stuff, break it down into smaller quantities, boat it across the Cebu. But anyway, they got the papers over there. And then they got a submarine. And they sent the papers to Australia. And uh, Philippi uh, MacArthur's headquarters went ballistic over this whole thing. And they said, without a doubt, it was one of the most important pieces of intelligence that we received in the Pacific War. And particularly when we started to invade Luzon, you know, in the Philippines and everything else, we had the whole Japanese battle plan. And so it saved thousands of lives. And this Filipino guerrilla, the Cebu guerrillas got credit for that. So. Any other questions? Thank you so much. It's all about story, isn't it?